Good evening. My name is Rita Hicks, and I would like to welcome you to this installment of Conversations with the Candidates on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Houston Area Education Fund. Uh, we'll get to the, tonight's race in just a moment, but first a couple of very important announcements. The first one is that our midterm voter guide is live. You can go on vote411.org now and search by zip code to find all of the races and measures that are on your ballot. Also information about where to show up for early voting and for voting on election day. Which leads me to my second point and that's that early voting starts on Monday, October 22nd. So it's coming up. You can vote anywhere in Harris County uh, during the early voting period. So find a time, take some friends, go for lunch and vote. Now, tonight we are going to be hearing from the candidates for U.S. Congressional District 29. Um, all candidates for the position were invited. The ones that you see before you tonight are the ones who accepted our invitation. And this is a very exciting race because the incumbent has actually chosen to retire. So there isn't an incumbent in this race. Both of our candidates are brand new and they are coming to you with a completely clean slate, which is very exciting. The first candidate we're going to be hearing from tonight is the, uh, is the Democratic candidate and that is State Senator Sylvia Garcia. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you to the League of Voters to, for providing the opportunity to have a conversation with the voters this evening. Absolutely. So just to start us off, uh, Senator, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first, I, I want to um, thank Jean Green for the many years of service. As you mentioned, this is a, uh, a race that does not have an incumbent, because Jean Green, after many years of service to our community, our region, and our country, has decided to retire. Uh, I'm running to, to fill that seat uh, to continue my service uh, to the public. I've been a, uh, a lifelong uh, advocate and a lifelong passionate public servant uh, working on issues that matter to working families and working on issues uh, that are important uh, for the most vulnerable populations. All right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So first question. Tonight. First question. Let's go. We're ready. So what are your unique qualifications to serve District 29 for Congress? Well, I think what, what sets me apart uh, in this race is my experience. I think now more than ever in Congress, we need someone who is going to be able to go to Congress and hit the ground running and, and know what it takes to, to be able to work on legislation, knows what it takes to work across the aisle to find common ground, knows what it takes to get things done. So I think uh, experience matters, especially uh, when we have so many, so much at stake uh, moving forward toward the future uh, in our country, uh, we need a, someone who's got a voice, uh, a strong voice, and to be that uh, and be more than just a vote. Thank you. Um, so obviously there are many issues that Congress is dealing with right now. What do you think are the top three facing people in your district and what's your vision for tackling them? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because for me, it's really very easy. You know, my district really wants the same things everybody else wants. They want a good job, a good job that holds their families together with good wages and benefits and a, a job where they, they can find equal pay for equal work, a job that provides a good livable wage. We need to increase the minimum wage and a job that, that, that provides the resources they need to to have a better quality of life for their families. I think the second thing that's really important is uh, health care. Uh, my community uh, is, is, um, is part of the growing group of people in Texas that are uninsured uh, or, or that cannot find uh, insurance because of, there's no affordability. Uh, they're worried. They're on Medicare or Medicaid. They're worried about cuts. Uh, so I want to make sure that we fight any cuts. If they're a veteran, uh, they know what it takes to have to be waiting in line or trying to receive the services that they need at the VA hospital. So we got to make sure that we protect our veterans and reward them and not punish them, but making them wait a long extended period of time for any kind of specialty care. And they're also worried that uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, may not may, may be attacked again. Uh, so I think for them it's about making sure that, that they have the health care when they need it and that we provide that for everyone. Uh, and that once they get a prescription, that they can fill it uh, because prescription prices are so high. So we need to make sure that we uh, lower the price on our prescriptions, for, especially for our seniors. And thirdly, it's education. Everyone wants a, uh, their child, their children to have a fair shot at the American dream. Uh, to me and to many people in my district, that's through education. It's the equalizer. It provides you an opportunity. I'm sure all three of us here know the benefits of a good education. So we got to make sure that it, uh, uh, colleges are affordable, 
and that our kids don't end up with, with debt to the ears that they can't find a good job because uh, they, they can't move on because they got to make sure that they pay their loans uh, so they're stuck. Uh, we got to make sure that uh, we start with pre-K and make sure that all our kids have access to pre-K uh, and work to make sure that our kids uh, graduate from college, that the teachers get bet, uh, paid well, and that we do everything we can to keep guns out of school classrooms. Uh, and we certainly need to make sure that we focus on classrooms and not bath, uh, bathrooms. And finally for us, because this is a Latino district, I'm going to be about making sure that we look at complete immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship. Uh, the, you know, the Trump administration currently in, in their zero tolerance policy uh, is just you know, uh, a, a step backwards. Uh, nobody wants to see children being ripped from their mother's arms. Nobody wants to see the inhumane treatment uh, that's being afforded a lot of children. You know, people in my district, like all Americans, you know, value families. Uh, we want to see babies in cradles. Uh, we don't want to see them in jails. We don't want to see them in, in, in cages. We want to make sure that, that people are treated right. So I think we need to look at what ICE is doing and not doing and make sure they're doing it right. And if it needs tweaking and if it needs replacement, that we do that. Because our country is a great country. We've always uh, honored and valued our immigration population. It's what makes our country stronger. So we should put a value on that. So for me, it's about speaking up for the things that matter to my district. And those are some of them. But again, it's, it's no different than in many other districts and many other families uh, to, uh, all across America. They just want to make sure that their kids can get a good education and get a fair shot at the American dream. Well, our next question was actually going to be about immigration oh, reform, well, good. so I'm going to skip ahead. Okay, great. Let's skip ahead, uh, too. <laughs> so with the resignation of Nikki Haley this week, concerns have been expressed about the future of our relationship with the United, Nation and its, United Nations and its allies. Um, do you believe there's a role for Congress in addressing those concerns? And if so, what does that look like? Well, I think the United Nations is a very important piece of, of the, our entire sort of foreign policy, international relations uh, 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 um, portfolio, if you will. Uh, so I think we need to make sure that we stay in the United Nations. And, and I would urge President Trump to, to search high and low to make sure we get the best person that we can to, 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 to be there as, as ambassador. Because I think it is really important uh, to make sure that America stands strong, not only here, here but abroad. Uh, because we've always been the global leader, and we need to maintain that strategy for, for a variety of reasons. And, and top of the list, of course, is for our own homeland security. We've got to make sure we're, we're, we're secure so that we can prosper. And I think working together with our friends and making sure that they remain our friends uh, across the world is important so the United Nations does have a role. Uh, I think Congress is, is going to have to maybe be a, be a little more assertive with the president on some of these issues because he he tends to, for example, on, on the terrorist situation, he's making a lot of people upset. Uh, everything from, from farmers to agricultural workers to uh, to our people and friends in and around the, the maritime uh, port of Houston industry. Uh, so we got to make sure that, that Congress uh, steps in when it needs to, uh, to provide the direction uh, that we need to move forward. The political environment today is um, not great. In fact, it's becoming increasingly partisan and uncivil. You notice that too? <laughs> it's hard to So miss. does the leak have a position <laughs> paper on that? <laughs> Civility is one of our cornerstones. Well, great. Um, I think that's a very valuable lesson for everyone. <laughs> we certainly agree at the league. Um, our question for you is, if elected, what's your vision for making change in, environment, in an environment like the one we have right now? Well, I think it starts with each, each and every single member. You know, I think that, that it's important for each of us to, to be, first of all, respectful and civil with each other. Uh, and I think it's important that we always recognize that we won't always agree uh, and maybe just work on some of the things that we do agree on. Uh, I know that that's the way I've always governed, uh, and I always know that when I run for an office, I may run as a Democrat, but once elected, when, as soon as I take that oath, I govern for everybody. You know, everybody who calls me about their Social Security or they call me about their VA benefit or they call me about problems uh, with their, with their health care in any way, 
it won't matter to me if you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, whether you voted for me or didn't vote or whether or not you're not registered, right? It's about making sure you deliver the constituent service. So I think we all need to work on it. Having said that, I think there's, I've visited with a lot of candidates um, this, this cycle, and I think there's, 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 there's hope because so many of us are committed uh, to being about the change for Washington because many of us are running for that reason, that we want to go there to make sure that it is a better working Congress, that, that it learns to, uh, to be more collegial and more respectful of each other. So I think if we, are, we're, we stick to that uh, and, and be about the change we want to be, uh, we'll be able to accomplish that. And, and I'm encouraged that it's not just Democrats who want to go there because they're tired of the way Washington not working. There's Republicans who feel the same way. So if both parties have people uh, that feel that way, it will be maybe not this cycle because there won't be enough of us to make a difference within each caucus. We'll, we'll start nibbling away at it. Uh, but then the next cycle, we might be able to do it. I, I'm very encouraged. I'm excited. And if given the opportunity, I'm going to, to be about trying to make that change. Thank you. Sure. Senator, I'm curious what sure. your vision is for a robust American economy, and what should Congress be doing to get us there? Well, I think the key to, to a robust economy is to making sure that, that everybody that, that, uh, that, that wants a job can get a job, but we've got to make sure that it's, that it's, it's a, a good paying job. Uh, I firmly believe that we do need to raise the minimum wage uh, because I know that, for example, uh, the, the um, Texas has always bragged about being a job creator, about having jobs. But if you look at the jobs and the pay scale, it's not the kind of jobs that someone can, can live on with a family of four uh, because many of them still have to get a second job. You know, you've got the professional salaries here and then you've got the everyday worker here. So we've got to do something to, to lift up our families and it starts with, with, with good pay. And then at second, I think we always should foster a, a, a good competitive spirit uh, in our markets. Uh, and that, that has to include encouraging uh, diverse, diversification in, in the uh, sectors that we uh, have, especially for us here in Houston. You know, remember back in the day, uh, maybe both of you are too young, I don't know if you were here in the 80s, or I guess it was the 80s when we had the bus, because we were we were so focused on one sector. So I think it's important that we, we uh, diversify. Uh, and we also got to make sure that we look to the future of where the jobs are coming, where the markets are being driven, so that we can better prepare for those. So I think it's a lot of us uh, working together to make sure we can accomplish that and, and, um, and work with our universities and our, and our uh, community colleges to make sure that we've got the workforce ready for it. Because you know, we can create a bunch of jobs, but if we don't have the people ready, then we don't, we don't really get to where we need to be. So I think it, it's everybody working together. I think we can get it done. Great. Thank you. Sure. So you touched on this a little bit in your remarks earlier, sure. but um, you know, healthcare continues to be a hot topic. There is a lot of uncertainty around the Affordable Care Act. There was a contest to it last year, which failed, but it remains sort of top of mind on both sides of the aisle. Um, I'm curious, what's your vision for a long-term solution to the problem of providing affordable health care to Americans, whether that it's the ACA or something else? Well, I think it is the ACA. I think it, it's working. Uh, I think the, uh, per, especially uh, any attempt to, to, to um, uh, remove the pre-existing conditions uh, uh, thing from the, from the insurance is just, you know, something that I think just I've seen more and more polls where people are in agreement. Nobody wants uh, to go back to that old rule. Uh, it, is, it is something that we need to continue. Uh, I think people that have, have also, um, uh, the whole, you know, the, the being able to carry your child to the age of 25 uh, on your insurance is something that's also very popular and nobody wants to see that change. So I think there's a lot of good parts of the Affordable Care Act uh, in Texas. Uh, it has helped almost a million people in, in, in removing and uh, in, in fighting the ACA and all the lawsuits that we have done that have not been successful. And I don't know how many times Congress has already tried. I think there were like at 40 plus t times to try to, to, uh, uh, to eliminate it. it. It's just to me time to move on. It, it's working. 
Uh, it's doing well. It's providing insurance for people who can't afford it. All the states have set up exchanges. There's been no real uh, problems with it. I think it's time for people to accept that it's working. And if we need to tweak something uh, later in the future, in the uh, later, because uh, I'd like to make sure that we again uh, get some controls on, on increased drug prices. And I need to. I'd like to make sure that uh, particularly our veterans and and, and people who are. Uh, young children, uh, that we continue the, the CHIP program, and that's not the Affordable Care Act, but, but they're all parts of the puzzle. It's important, important to continue those programs, so we cannot let our, our friends and our relatives, our neighbors, go around being sick. You just can't do that. It's inhumane. Thank you. Thank you. So, if you are elected to Congress, a big part of your job will be that of, as an influencer. Um, talk about what kind of influencer you are and how you plan to use that influence towards specific outcomes. Well, I'm not sure if I like the word influencer. I would like to think that, that, that I can be a voice and a strong voice for, for people that, that don't have a voice now. I've always been a, 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 a fighter. You know, I started out as a social worker. Uh, moved on to be a legal aid lawyer, then a judge, and uh, then I began my elected career as, as city controller, then county commissioner. So I've always been there fighting uh, for working families to make sure that, that our children uh, have, a, have the, 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 the health care that they need and the schools and the teachers that they need uh, to make sure that, that our veterans are, uh, are protected, to make sure that our seniors uh, have the uh, care that they do. So I think it for me, it's it's not about being an influencer. It's about being a good advocate and a fighter. And so I've been a champion for for workers and a champion for 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 the most vulnerable populations for many years. And I want to continue to be that champion. Sure. So the next question on our list had to do with bathrooms, but I feel like you kind of already talked about that a little bit. Which bathroom were you talking about? <laughs> well, you know, earlier this year, the Department of Education announced that it's no longer going to consider civil rights com complaints related to... Oh, that part of the... You mean the bathroom bill. Right. <laughs> with, I'm happy to pause there for a moment if you'd actually like to answer the question, um, which is that you know, what's your what's your view of the fact that this the Department of Education at least no longer considers these complaints um, as investigable civil rights complaints? Well, I just I just think it's wrong, and I just th think it was wrong to reverse that policy, and I I think it was wrong for for the state of Texas to spend so much time on such a nonsense issue that that we never found and they were never able to even cite one complaint or one incident in the state of Texas that 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 that, that we needed to address. Uh, it was, in my judgment, a, a, a very uh, uh, waste of tax dollars when we should have been focused on funding public education, uh, providing pre-K for all our kids, making sure that our, our uh, vulnerable populations have access to, to health care, particularly kids with, with, with diseases that, that, that put them in the most vulnerable uh, situations. Uh, I just think it was atrocious. I, I fought, fought, fought it long and hard. Uh, and I'm just really pleased that we were succeeded. However, we should be aware that, that it may come up again and, and that, that the fight will be continued. I, I just don't think that uh, we need to continue on that and uh, it is just wrong to, uh, to target uh, uh, children in such a, a you know, delicate you know, situation uh, and, and treat them unfairly. And, and I, I call it you know, abuse by bureaucracy. Uh, when, when things like that happen. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so if elected, how would you balance the demands of the congressional calendar with the needs of, uh, of your constituency? Well, you know, sometimes you really just don't have a choice. I mean, if you have to be in, in Washington because you've got votes and you've got recess and you've got, I mean, you, you're not in recess, then you have to be in Washington. But I'm committed to, to do just as I did when, when now, do now as a state senator. When I was in session, uh, as soon as the, 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 the gavel was, uh, was banged and we were, we were uh, done for the day, uh, I walked off the floor and into the car and, and came back to Houston to take care of the district business. That's what I'll continue to do as a member of Congress in Washington. Uh, I'll be home here on the weekends. I will, I've always had town hall meetings. Uh, we'll continue to do those. Uh, we've always had a lot of uh, important community events 
uh, like backpack giveaways for the children who, who can't afford to have backpacks, uh, doing health fairs for our seniors, uh, doing uh, community events with, with our veterans. You know, it's, it's about making sure that you're on the ground so that you don't lose touch, so that you know what your district needs. I'm also already committed and, and have talked to several groups about forming some advisory uh, councils. Uh, I know I talked with uh, some friends in the Jewish committee about having an advisory council on issues that are important with, to Israel and its peace and prosperity, and I stand with Israel and continue to do that. I uh, already have an existing senior council as a state senator. I want to continue that so I can con continue to listen to the seniors uh, every, every time I'm home. On, on what their needs might be. And we have a, a, a high school kind of voter group, civic engagement group that, that we meet with. So I think it's important to do those things so that you know uh, what your district needs, so that you know what the district is, is thinking about, so that you can go back to Washington and work on those issues. So, um, and certainly I'm going to listen and hear on anything that the League of Women Voters uh, has to say, because obviously I've worked with you all for, for many years, and I know that when the uh, position paper comes in from the League of Women Voters, that's something I have to read. Well, thank you. We'll be sure to pass that along to sure. anyone thank not you. watching. <laughs> sure. That's right. Our research teams will be so pleased. Um, so you mentioned already that uh, you've been in public service for a long time, and in fact, all politicians are public servants. So what does uh, servant leadership mean to you? I think it's, it's, it's um, being a good listener. It, it's about um, making sure that, that, that what you're doing is the priorities of, of your district and the, the people that you serve, uh, and not your own personal or political agenda. Uh, and, it, and, and it thinks there's also a lot of, of patience involved uh, and uh, making sure that you can balance competing interests uh, because, you know, our, our district, our region is very diverse in its people, in its food. We've talked about food earlier uh, in, in, its, in its economies. So you have to make sure that, that, that when you're serving that you reflect all that. Uh, it's really not about you once you're elected and you take that office. It's about serving the people that elected you. So for me, that will always be the priority in my district. Yeah. We're ready for last question. Last, last question. question. You drew the first and last. I did. So last question. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow, the Astros start a seven-game series. Hopefully, we won't need that many. So, what is your prediction for this game? Uh, the series, the series oh, the Astros are going to win, of course, and I hope to be at one of the games next week here in, in uh, home turf. So uh, I think they've been doing really great. Uh, and let me just say that uh, I thought it was great that the Texans beat the Cowboys, especially since most of their brothers are big Cowboys fans. Uh, so I, I'm always about uh, uh, our home teams, uh, but if not our home team, then a Texas team. Awesome. Well, we are coming up on the end of our time together, Senator. So if you would like to just take the next couple of minutes, about three minutes, um, and let the folks at home know why you think they should vote for you. Oh, okay. Well, hello again. My name is Sylvia Garcia, and I'm state senator, and I'm also the Democratic nominee for District 29. Uh, as I've said it here tonight, I've always been a champion for our district, um, and I've always been there to fight for our working families to make sure that their children get a fair shot at the American dream. I want to go to Congress because I want to focus on the issues that matter to most of us and, and to people in my district. And that includes education, uh, health care, uh, immigration reform, and good jobs that hold families together. So for me, it's about making sure that working families uh, have the the, edu have the education in pre-K and, and all the needs that they uh, need for their children to succeed. And it will also be about making sure to protect our, our families uh, and that we not be separated in any way. Uh, to that end, I, I support the, affordable, the Immigration uh, Reform Act uh, to ensure that people have a pathway to citizenship, to make sure that our dreamers are protected, and to ensure that we stop any any immigration policy that tears families apart and takes children away from their families. I've always fought for you and I've always been a champion. I want to be able to continue to do that for you in Congress. Again, I'm Sylvia Garcia, the Democratic nominee. Uh, I appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us tonight. You have just been hearing from uh, Texas State Senator Sylvia Garcia, the Democratic candidate for U.S. Congressional District 29. Sit tight. We'll be back with the next candidate in just a minute. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Rita Hicks with, here with my co-host Courtney Siegfried on behalf of the League of Women Voters talking to your candidates for U.S. Congressional District 29. Next up is the Republican candidate for District 29, Mr. Philip Aronoff. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me back. Absolutely. So we're going to get into a lot of questions about your qualifications and the issues and whatnot. But first, why don't you take a moment and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you. Thanks to the League of Women Voters for inviting me back. I enjoyed the first time I was here during the primaries. Uh, I'm a lifelong Houstonian, moved here as a little boy shortly after the Second World War. My father was transferred here and I grew up, graduated Bel Air High and University of Houston, had a career in the steel industry and the granite industry for many years, served on many uh, co community boards and commissions. Uh, Governor Clements appointed me to be the chairman of the Texas Purchasing and General Services Commission. Uh, Kathy Whitmire appointed me to be the second, uh, the former mayor, Kathy Whitmire, the second uh, president of this, this TV station. So I was there in the infancy of it. I was on the board when they formed it and then uh, became the second president. I, I serve as the honorary consul general for the country of Hungary, so I've been very involved in the uh, international community here, serving as secretary of the 95-member consul corps of the city of Houston. Thank you. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, your first question, in addition to all the things you just told us, um, what do you think are your unique qualifications to serve District 29 in Congress? I'm a businessman. Uh, and I've had a lot of experience in political campaigns. I've worked a lot of campaigns, ne never as a candidate, never thought I'd be a candidate. I'm not a career politician, uh, never held elected office, and, and, and never anticipated it. Uh, but I was worried this time that uh, the message of conservatism was not getting out to this community. Uh, that the conservative movement has been effectively branded uh, by the Democrats as, uh, as a bunch of hate mongers and racists and xenophobes and bigots. And that's not who the conservative movement is. It, I think it has greater compassion because it wants to give people greater freedom uh, than, than, the, than the other party does. We want to let people lead their own lives and rise to their own potential. And so bringing that philosophy to government is why I'm running for office and why I think as, as a businessman and a non-career politician that I can be the most effective uh, a person to represent District 29. Thank you. You're welcome. So obviously uh, Congress deals with many, many issues, but in your opinion, um, what are the top three issues facing the people in your district and what's your vision for tackling them? 
Well, flooding, of course, is one of the biggest issues in this district because there are a lot of people lost their homes, a lot of people suffered damage, uh, just incalculable damage from, from the hor horrific floods that we had. So that's one of the first responsibilities of government. As a conservative, I believe in smaller government, but I certainly acknowledge the government has major responsibilities in the infrastructure, and that means protecting the people by building the infrastructure to protect them. So if, if elected, I will be sure to make sure that $2.5 billion from the bond money is well spent and the 29th district gets its fair, its fair share of it and that the federal government gives the support that we need in the 29th district. Uh, the other issues is good education. I think we've been weak on education in our, in our schools here. Uh, and then health care, of course. I, I would work to revamp the health care system significantly. Thank you. Right. So Congress has struggled recently, and for some would say for many years, um, with finding a solution to comprehensive immigration reform. What does that phrase mean to you, and what do you think is the first step? I published an article in the Houston Chronicle in July. Uh, during World War II, we had a tremendous shortage of labor. And the way we got labor, we brought them in from Mexico and Central America. The program was called the Bracero Program. And it worked well because people could come in while, the, while our people were off fighting during World War II. People could come here and work in the factories and, clean, and pick the crops so we could feed the soldiers. Uh, and the, the program ended in the 60s. A lot of reason it ended was some pressure from the labor unions felt that they were competing with them. <clears throat> but today we have proven uh, how to stimulate an economy and create jobs. And now the biggest problem, if you drive through the 29th Congressional District, Every business there has a big sign, help wanted, hiring, needing people. Uh, and so if we need people uh, from Latin America or any other country, uh, the, the policy that I wrote about, I call it Bracero II, and what that policy is, is, is that you give a, a, a visa, work visa, to people who come and apply, have a clean record, they buy health insurance before they come here, uh, and then they can come here and work. And you limit the number of visas so that the, you don't have too many outstanding un, visas with the people without a job at any one time and uh, that will solve the, the worker shortage and the people won't have to pay the coyotes to smuggle them across the border and they won't have to die in the desert of Arizona or in the back of a van in uh, Wharton, Texas, which happened about three or four years ago when 18 young people died in the back of a van. And that really upset me uh, that the, these people, all they wanted to do was come here to get a job and feed their families. And, and I, I blame our, our government somewhat for, for creating that that's the only way they could get here was to bribe somebody. And then if we, uh, if, if we have a system where they can come in legally, come and go, they don't have to bring their families, and if they come in legally, uh, the, the Border Patrol and the police will be able to go after the bad guys who want to smuggle drugs in and human trafficking, and that's, that's how we would control it. Thank you, sir. So next question, with the resignation of Nikki Haley this week, there's been some concern expressed about what impact that's going to have on the United States relationship with the United Nations and with its allies. Um, do you believe there's a role for Congress in addressing some of these concerns? And if so, what should that role be? Well, certainly have the role of the Senate of advising consent of uh, the president for any ambassador. But the President of the United States is responsible for foreign policy, not the, uh, not Congress. I mean, we give our uh, Congress and the Senate, again, is advising consent. But uh, I don't see why one ambassador leaving and somebody else coming would be disruptive at all. I mean, that happens constantly. I mean, it happens. Ambassadors all over the world are constantly changing, and the po policy is set by the President, and all the, the ambassador does is, is implement the president's policy. So I don't see uh, any impact uh, of her leaving as far as the long range and long term uh, issues with the United Nations. Thank you. You're welcome. I think all of us can agree that the political environment has become increasingly um, partisan and frankly uncivil. So if elected, what's your vision for making actual change in that kind of environment? There's so much at stake, there's so much power, so much control over the lives of people. I have defined the difference in conservatives and liberals is where on the scale, going from left to right, uh, government control goes. 
uh, you know, where does it stop? Where, where do people have the individual freedom or where do they have to fo follow the dictates of the government? And there's such a difference in the two parties on how much con control government should have over our lives. The sad thing is it's getting irreconcilable, which is what causes all this stress. Uh, but but the, the conservatives want to keep the government out of our lives. They want to give you the freedom to rise to the best of your potential. The, the liberals, what they want to do is control everything. They want to control the size of your toilet bowl. They want to control the light bulb you can use, how many miles per gallon your car gets. So these are becoming irreconcilable differences. So the only way to solve it is just to elect all, all Republicans. Um, the next, so completely changing, uh, changing the subject for a moment. Um, what is your vision? You mentioned you're a businessman. What's your vision for a robust American economy and what actions do you think Congress should be taking to achieve that vision? Stay out of the economy. We have proven now, I mean, we have proven beyond any doubt that by reducing taxes and reducing regulations, I mean, you we're building pipelines, which, which you couldn't build under the previous government. Uh, you know, we're going to bring back coal where, where you need coal and it's a cheap form of energy. But when the government is setting <clears throat> all these regulations, it's devastating to the economy. I was a small businessman. I know how difficult it is when the government is telling me what I have to do, here I have to do it, why I have to do it, when it makes no business sense. Because you've got bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. making these rules, and they don't have to live with those rules. And so the less government interference you have in business, the better off you're going to be. In, in moving forward with, uh, with the economy and keep taxes low. People do not work to pay taxes. That's the whole issue. When you cut the tax rates, people are going to work harder to make more money because they get to keep it. Okay, well, we're going to tackle another hot topic. I can so. handle it. <laughs> All right. So healthcare continues to be a hot topic at the national level, but no clear path has really been charted since the failure of the ACA repeal bill last year. So what's your vision for a long-term solution to the problem of providing affordable health care to all Americans? Well, you have to recognize the major distinction between health care and insurance. Right now, we have very expensive insurance with enormous deductibles, which is almost like having no insurance at all. And then you have most doctors aren't going to take a lot of it because it doesn't pay them enough uh, f from the government uh, health care bills. So I want to get the government out of it as much as they can. If you want to go buy a new sweater, you're going to choose, do I want to go to Macy's? Do I want to go to, to Sears and Roebuck before they went out of business? But you get to choose that. Well, you don't get to choose that with hospitals or doctors or anything like that. It has to be in your plan. The doctor has to be there. So again, I want to get the government out of the healthcare business. Thank you. You're welcome. You don't have to say thank you. That's what I'm here for, is to answer your question. That's all right. Well, we are we are um, we are happy to be educating voters. Um, so and I thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it is most certainly our pleasure. So much of a congressperson's work is as an influencer because you, ma you make decisions by consensus in Congress. So talk about what kind of influencer you are and how you plan to influence toward outcomes if elected. Well, I, I think the values represented by the conservative movement, the values of, of hard work, of love of God, of, of, of devotion to your church, community, patriotism, service in the military, uh, those are the values that I believe come from the conservative movement. I don't see those values on the other side. In fact, I see the other side mocking a lot of those values. They're the ones that say you can't say a prayer uh, before a football game at, at, a, at a high school. And, and, and all the other issues that, that they fight, the, what, the, the, what I call family value issues. So, so my influence would be as a, a, a man who's lived his life according to those family values, and I'd be an advocate for those values and, and reward those values and not reward uh, the, the, what I consider antisocial values and what, what society has defined as, as the, the non-social uh, values for society. You didn't thank me for that one. Uh, no, I thank you. All right. You hurt my feelings. I thought you didn't like that answer. <laughs> I told him not to do it anymore. I know. Well, but you told me you were going to. All right. 
So the Department of Education earlier this year announced that they'll no longer investigate civil rights complaints from transgender students barred from school bathrooms that match their gender identity. What is your position on this issue? I think gender is not a state of mind. It is a physical thing. It's X, XX chromosome and X or Y chromosomes. That's what determines gender. It's not something you think about that, you, that, you, that depends on what you think. I mean, if you see a dog on the street, you don't ask the dog, are you a girl dog or a boy dog? You look and see. And, and I don't think human beings are that much different as far as what gender, so-called gender identity is. I mean, it's a matter of physical law. You have a definition, define a man, define a woman. If you fall within that definition, it's not what you think, it's what you are scientifically, biologically, and factually. So I, I think it's an issue that's created for social engineering that's very, very destructive uh, to these young people when you have a young person who may be confused and to sit there and, and play to that I think is damaging and it, to the form of child abuse. I was asked that question last time I was here, and I said, was that the answer you were expecting? And he said, no, but I don't know what you were expecting, but anyway. Um, thank you. What, You're welcome. The only yeah. thing that we're expecting is to let our viewers at home get a good idea of, uh, of who you are as a candidate. I okay. feel like you're doing a good job of that. Well, thank you. Um, ah, thank you. <laughs> we're so polite, all of us. Yeah. Um, okay. So... If elected, how would you balance the demands of a congressional calendar with the need to stay in touch with the needs and concerns of people actually in your district? Well, I'd come home every weekend, meet with my grandchildren. I have two of my grandchildren uh, living here, and that's my, the joy of my life. So I want to come home and be with them, and I want to be with the constituents because I have learned to uh, know the people in the district, love the people in the district. I mean, that's been the most exciting part of being a candidate. I mean, I have met the most amazing, wonderful, caring people uh, that love their city, love their families. And they want me to help them, and I want to help them. So, I mean, United Airlines, I'm a million and a half miler right now. I'll probably go up to two million. At my age, I didn't anticipate making two million, but if I win this election, I anticipate making it. That's a lot of miles. Yeah, well, I've, a lot of miles. I was I, just doing I, the math in my head. Well, I've spent my career in, the, in an airplane. I mean, I've been an international businessman traveling overseas for 50 years. And so, uh, I mean, when I started flying, it was Texas International with uh, turboprops. So uh, I, I, I used to fly before they ever opened Intercontinental Airport. So that's how long I've been doing this. And so I've flown a lot of miles. My dad was a Texas International pilot. So really? He probably been flew me. Yeah, he probably, he probably flew probably me. probably did back in the day. Um, so members of Congress, um, like all politicians, are public servants. What does servant leadership mean to you? Well, I think I've demonstrated that by, by serving uh, the people of Hungary, uh, serving the people of Texas as, as leader of the General Services Commission, as I said, appointed by Governor Clements, uh, serving on this board. I also served on the Harris County Housing Authority Board, served on a lot of charity boards as well. So public service and giving back to this community is uh, is what my wife and I have uh, spent our lives trying to do. Governor Abbott appointed my wife to the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission because of her activities in the community. Right, thank you. I wanna uh, circle back a little bit. So we talked to you about what your vision is for a robust American economy. Um, one of the related concerns that we hear about a lot in the news is job readiness among not only our uh, graduating seniors and gra college graduates, but also among uh, workers whose jobs are um, you know, slowly being replaced either by equipment or outsourcing or what have you. So do you feel that Congress has a role in fostering wor workforce development programs and why or why not? Yeah, I, I think Congress has the ability to direct some of the funds that they, they give for education to vocational education. I think this country is very weak on vocational education. Uh, I, I have been with my, my colleagues from Germany where they, they have the program, the uh, journeyman program, where they train people in companies. I don't think we have anything like that set up here. Uh, Anise Parker had a, a committee to look at, at setting up uh, these types of programs in uh, in Houston, and we talked about it, and then her term expired, and the board was dis was uh, dismantled. Uh, 
Uh, but I think there's an opportunity for stronger vocational education. Everybody doesn't need a college degree today uh, to, to advance uh, and the skills that you need. So I'm a big supporter of vocational education. I think the community colleges are a gift to, to mankind here, to, to, the, to people in the community. Uh, and and uh, they do a great job on, uh, on teaching people skills uh, for, for vocations. So the federal government can help direct money specifically for vocational education. At the top of the segment, um, you mentioned Houston's flood problem. So I'm curious to know what role do you think that Congress has in flood prevention as well as flood recovery? Well, I, I believe in smaller government, but I do believe that the collective must protect the communities. So I'm not, I don't want to see the federal government come with, you know, with all the programs <clears throat> that they think is best for Houston because what works in, in uh, the panhandle of Florida may not work in Houston. So I want the government to give grants to these areas for serious good proposals that they bring there. I don't want the government making the decision where to build the third reservoir. Uh, that's not what I want to see the federal government do. I want to see them pay for a lot of it, but I want to see them direct where and how it should be done. Uh, so we talked about the political climate earlier, but the delegation in Greater Houston in general is is bipartisan in makeup, or has historically been, and the trend is that it will continue to be a pretty even combination of Republicans and Democrats. So how would you, if elected, continue to work with that group of Congress people in order to ensure that the entire Greater Houston region is well, well represented in Congress in its decisions? Well, I don't want to get my dear friend Al Green in trouble. But Al Green and I have been friends for 30 years, and, and for many years, we'd have lunch four or five times a year, where I would bring conservative leaders, mayoral candidates, uh, state representatives, congressmen, and we'd have lunch and we'd talk about the issues, because Al Green at that time was the head of the NAACP. And I wanted him to understand uh, that we aren't haters, we don't want to kill little babies, we don't want to hurt people, we want to empower people. And so he, I gave him, and he said to me, it gave him an understanding of where the, the, the Republican Party is coming from. Uh, so Al said, if I win, I can live with him. So Al, if you're watching, I'm going to hold you to it. I think um, that might be a YouTube show that people no, would he's, watch. We, 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 we've been going out with his girlfriend and my wife to, to dinner for 15 years. I mean, just a, a great human being. I, I love the man. He's just, uh, I do. But anyway. So, you know, if you have paid attention at all to the news or Stephen Kleinberg's studies, you know that Houston is the most diverse city in the country, according to many metrics. Um, and District 29 is certainly diverse. So it's 75% Hispanic, and, and then uh, you know 8% African American, about 4% Asian, and then the rest mixed. But you know when you get to 75% Hispanic, I don't consider that diverse. So I, I, I find it rather than calling 29 diverse, I call it more of a Hispanic uh, district. Sure. So uh, from your perspective, if you were elected, how do you serve the different perspectives and values and priorities of your constituents? Primero hablo español, entonces puedo hacerlo en español. I can talk to the people in Spanish. Uh, but how do you serve them? Because they all have the same needs, the same desires. Uh, they want to, a better lives for themselves and their families. And I don't see any difference in what one person's need is from another to, to improve their lives and have it. I want the, to ensure that the infrastructure is there to enable everybody who wants to work hard to move ahead, raise a family, and that's my goal. Great. So when we talked about uh, um, the economy, the other comment that you had was about taxation and keeping taxes low so that the money stays in people's pockets. That's um, difficult to balance against some of those needs like infrastructure that simply require money. So what does the appropriate balance of um, taxes versus free economy look like to you? I'll tell you a story. Ronald Reagan used to tell the story. 
Back in the 1950s, the maximum tax rate on, on the marginal dollar earned was 90%, and he got $100,000 for every movie, and he was already up to the 90% rate. And he was offered to, to make a movie and get his $100,000 fee. He said, I'd have kept $10,000. It wasn't worth it to me. So I said, no, I'm not going to make the movie. And the movie wasn't ever made, and it didn't affect Ronald Reagan's life. But the, the makeup artist, the script writer, the gaffer, the, boo, the cameraman, none of these people had the job that they would have had if he would have had enough incentive to, 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 make, that, to, to make that movie. So that is the best example that I can give of how people don't work to pay taxes. Look, the people who scream about higher taxes are the ones who are screaming the loudest now that they can't deduct their state taxes from the national taxes. Well, if they think we're not being taxed high enough, they should say, yay, that I, I don't get to deduct that anymore. Now I get to pay more taxes because they're the ones advocating that we all should in California and New York. So they understand it. They just want to play, play both sides against the middle. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I know we're nearing the last question, but not quite there yet, or are probably, we there? Probably last question. So All right. Eeny, meeny, miny, no? You Courtney's got the it. last question. All right. Courtney, it's yours. I'm going to go. Be gentle on me, Courtney. All right. This is, this is the not a softball one? question. Uh-oh. Baseball question. I got to go, I think. <laughs> this is the easiest one of the night, because there's only one answer. So we know that the Astros are um, going back to at least the division series um, tomorrow, or sorry, league series tomorrow. So what is your prediction um, when they face the Red Sox? The Astros are going to win. What are they winning in? Baseball. <laughs> how many games? <laughs> oh, how many games? It's a seven-game series or a five game? It's a seven. Four games. Got it. All right. Are they headed I'll knock on wood. <laughs> and who do you think they're going to face in the World Series? I have no idea. I'm voting for the Dodgers. Uh, we'll I'm voting repeat. for the Dodgers. <laughs> no. I'm voting for the Dodgers. That would be the ultimate grudge match. Uh, well, Mr. Ernoff, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us tonight. We have only about three minutes remaining, and we'd like to give them to you to um, address our viewers at home and tell them why you think they should vote for you. Well, Rita, thank you. Thank you for your husband's service to our country. I really admire that. And uh, I served in the Texas Air National Guard 50 years ago. Uh, but uh, that wasn't a sacrifice like your husband made. And Courtney, thank you for being here tonight. You both are much prettier than the other two guys who interviewed me the last time. So, uh, But why, why I think the people should vote for me? Because I represent the values that they live their lives by. And, and I, I will be able to continue to, to promote those values and to make it easier for them not to have to deal with extraneous issues. Um, you know, I, I, I heard uh, the previous, uh, my opponent, talk about the, the, the Senate spending all this time on, on the bathroom issues. Well, it's because she's one of the ones who are keeping it up there and keeping it front and center. And, and she's right. They shouldn't spend time with things like that. Uh, but but I, I believe that... that I can be an advocate for what, what District 29 needs. Uh, I had a business inside the Port of Houston for, uh, for 28 years. I know the district. I know the port. I know what the port needs. I know, understand how vital it is. As a diplomat, I'm very close to the, the Consul General of Panama. I spent a lot of time talking to him about the, what Houston needs with the reopening of the new expanded Panama Canal. That's very important for Houston. We are the center of the United States, and that makes us such a major port. California is such a difficult port, and now these big ships with 15,000 containers on them can come through the Panama Canal, which are the most before was a 6,000 container ship. And so when we can bring them here, that's so good for the Houston economy, but it requires help from the government in dredging out the ship channel. And, uh, and, and so I'll, I'll be certainly an advocate for that. Uh, I support the oil industry. I believe in a strong oil industry. Uh, I think the alternatives without taxes don't work. And, uh, and I will be an advocate for the oil industry in Washington. That's what Houston centered on. Houston has 93 consulates, and the reason they're all here, we're the third largest consulate corps in the United States, is because of the energy business. When Russia opened their first consulate outside of New York, it was here. Same with China. There's a reason for that.
So thank you again for having me. Thanks to the League of Women Voters. And uh, I look forward to future times here if I'm elected. If not, this is my one and only shot in politics. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You have just been hearing from Philip Aronoff, Republican candidate for United States Congressional District 29. Um, that concludes our show for tonight. Just a couple of closing comments for you. Uh, just remember, our voter guide is live now. You can visit vote411.org and search by zip code for the races that, uh, that are going to be on your ballot. Um, Early voting starts Monday, October 22nd, coming up soon. You can find any information that you need about where to early vote on vote411.org and uh, also where to vote on Election Day, which is coming up on November 6th. On behalf of my co-host Courtney Siegfried and myself, Rita Hicks, the League of Women Voters Education Fund, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you missed any portion of this episode, you should be able to see it on Houston Media Source YouTube channel. Um, thank you for watching and have a great night.